Okay, so today we are looking at the pathograph. When it comes to the pathograph, you'll find that during OSC, probably they'll give you a dummy with certain uh, parameters. So now, uh, apart from that, in the actual sense, or why we use the pathograph, where we use the pathograph is that we use it in the labor and we use it to monitor the progress of labor. You'll find that most you will check the pathograph in an interval of four hourly, and then you monitor how the labor is progressing. Apart from that, when it comes to the pathograph, mainly you just need to understand how to plot it and how to interpret the findings. So as usual, when uh, a client comes, you need to fill in the client's name. Apart from that, fill in the gravida, meaning how many pregnancies have they had, and you need to count the one that they have come with. So if the, base, if the client has had three pregnancies before, and this is the fourth one, you're going to record D4. And para is the number of live births or number of children that uh, live births that they, are, they have had before. So in this case, you say three uh, and probably plus one because they have come with the, uh, the fourth one. Then you need to fill in the hospital number, date of admission, time of admission as well. And you need to indicate whether the membranes are still intact or they have uh, ruptured. Then also fill in the hours, uh, the time at which the membranes are de ruptured. So after you fill in that demographic information for the client, you, are, you will now start with the section, this particular middle section, uh, talking about um, talking about the descent as well as the dilatations. So we'll move on to this particular section. Okay. Okay. So we need to start with the middle section. And this section, this one, which is talking about, because that is where you start from. You talk about the dilatations, the descent, and the avenues. Okay, so where is the erase? I just remove these numbers. Okay, so that is where we are going to start from before we move on anywhere else. The reason we start from this particular section, it's because you only open up the pathograph if the cervix is four centimeters widely open. That is when you open the pathograph. So in this particular case, we'll start first of all by checking the descent so that we take note of, uh, I mean the cervix dilatation so that we take note of how wide the cervix is dilated. So you need to have the knowledge of vaginal examination when you're plotting the, uh, the pathograph because VE will be mainly done for hourly. Uh, when you are, when a woman is in labor. So let's take the woman has just been brought and at that particular moment when the woman has been brought, uh, the cervix is uh, six centimeters wide dilated. You go in with the two fingers and you measure the dilatation, you find that it is six centimeters widely dilated. You will find that you are going to go where there is a six here and follow this particular line and where it intersects with the alert line you are going to put in. Uh, a C, an X like that. So the normal figures when you're plotting on the pathograph should lie on the alert line and not on the action line. So we'll talk about the action line later on. But then you find that if the woman comes at six centimeters wide dilated, you follow the line and you put an X where the line intersects uh, from on the, um, on the alert line. Then from there, the other thing that you need to do is that uh, you need brought in. Okay, so you need to fill in at what time has this client of yours be, or also follow it up nicely how the graph is subsequent uh, observations. So in this particular case, let me just remove these lines. Okay, so in this particular case, what we said was uh, the woman comes in and the cervix is six centimeters wide dilated, meaning you plot there, and then you need to follow this line here. So if uh, the client was brought in at 13 hours, you are going to put here as 13 hours, and this becomes your hour one since the client was brought in. But if the client was brought in with the cervix dilated at four centimeters, meaning your X is literally here, and your hour one is this one. And if this was 11 hours, you put as 11 hours. So uh, this indicates a full hour and this will be our hour two. So if the patient teaches for 14 hours, it will be hour two. And this will continue, you keep on plotting like that, 16, 17 hours, 
and this will continue changing to our three and this will be our four and this will be our five so this will continue like that but remember mainly you will check the uh, the cervical dilatation at least uh, four hourly but mainly in normal circumstances the cervix should just uh, dilate about a centimeter in one hour so if you're doing it two hourly you need to know that at least the cervix should only dilate about two centimeters uh, in two hours or four centimeters in four hours. So we expect a client who has been brought in uh, with a cervical dilatation of around six centimeters to reach around the full dilatations, which, which is 10 centimeters uh, after four hours. Nevertheless, sometimes you'll find that a woman comes in at six centimeters, then after four hours, the cervix is still at, uh, after four hours, the cervix is still at, uh, at seven centimeters. It means that you are going to plot, let's say you go after seven hours, meaning you are going to follow this line and where four hours is. After four hours, you find that this particular woman still has the dilatations of around uh, seven centimeters, meaning you may plot somewhere there and you find that this particular graph has started shifting from the alert line it is heading towards the action line so in this particular case you need to uh, to determine what is causing this graph to deviate immediately because it could be maybe kefalo, uh, kefalo uh, pelvic disproportion uh, it means that this baby won't come out probably you need to take this woman from an emergency section or other causes like uh, a weak uterine wall or other things. So immediately the graph starts heading towards the action line. It means that there's some action that you need to do to make this woman eh, deliver. But in normal circumstances, you'll find that maybe after four hours, the same four hours that we are talking about, at our four, when you check the cervical dilatation, probably you find that they are uh, they are at ten centimeters widely dilated. It means that this particular woman is now ready to start pushing to deliver. So those are circumstances through which you may see uh, the graph shifting to action. It means it is prompting you to do something uh, because this labor is not progressing normally. Okay. So that is about the plotting. So after you plot uh, those figures, the next thing that you need to, to, to do as well is the descent. You need to check the descent. So when it comes to the descent, descent is either zero, is either zero over five. At this particular point, it means that the fetal head is completely in the pelvic brim and this baby uh, literally is ready to come out. But uh, a descent of five over five, it means that this baby is still very far from coming out. And the reason we use the descent by using uh, five, then a number five figure is because we are using our five hand to measure descent. So you put the five fingers from where the symphysis pubic bone is and where the bulging or uh, growth of the pregnancy is starting from. And then if you how many, how many fingers are able to feel the fetal head. So if we, about when the woman is brought in at six centimeters, you find that about uh, four fingers are able to feel the fetal head. It means that you put a zero. You need to indicate with a zero like that where four is and where it is intersecting with the, the six because this is the time we had opened this particular pathogram, a pathograph. If we opened it at four, you put an intersection zero on this particular line because we have op opened it at uh, uh, at four centimeters. But in this particular case, because our pathograph is opened at six centimeters, so our, our zero will be here, indicating that the descent at six centimeters were at four, uh, 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 were at four over five. Then as you continue checking, you'll find that when it comes to descent, when it comes to descent, uh, you need to do it every after each vaginal examination, which you can do it at four hourly or at two hourly. Then apart from that, you need to also document the time that is uh, how the descent is taking place. Maybe let's say after four hours, you do vaginal examination, you find that there, uh, the descent is now at 
two centimeters. It means that roughly after two hours, the descent may come and be at one centimeter or literally at zero uh, centimeters, meaning zero over five. So when the graph is moving in this particular manner for descent, this is normal because it is it needs to move all the way from five going down to zero because at zero it means that you are now ready to deliver this particular woman so that is how we plot descent and we use our five fingers to assess how the baby is descending uh, entering or passing or negotiating through the pelvic brim so after checking the descent, you now come to this particular portion, which is labeled amniotic fluid, uh, with this particular portion labeled amniotic fluid, and also check for mouthing. So amniotic fluid, let's say we are following still this particular line. So at six centimeters, rather we had plotted this line. So all the way up, we'll still record uh, our information uh, the time we had opened this part of graph in. So our recording should be in these boxes like that. Okay. So apart from that, when it comes to, uh, to the amniotic fluid, so when it comes to amniotic fluid, you check whether the amniotic fluid, uh, which is basically the lycra, which we call lycra, whether the membranes, the first thing, whether the membranes are still intact or if the membranes have ruptured. So if the membranes have ruptured on top there, you record with a C. And this showed that membranes ruptured with a clear amniotic fluid. Then apart from that, if the amniotic fluid have just ruptured on your face, you need to uh, observe or check what color it is. If the membranes are still intact, you indicate with an eye on top there where it says membrane, it means that the membranes are still intact. However, when you go in with two fingers, you find that the membranes are meconium stained, uh, meaning the membranes, uh, the, muc uh, the amniotic fluid rather, they are meconium stained, meaning they have uh, they are mixed with the feces of the baby. You are going to indicate with an M here. It shows that the amniotic fluid is meconium stained. Uh, if it is odd meconium, if it if it is odd meconium as well, if it is odd meconium, you indicate with the OM. Uh, you indicate with OM like this. And this showed that it is OD meconium. Then apart from that, if it is blood stained, you are going to put a B showing that the amniotic fluid is bloody stained. So this would de in, uh, determine what you find at that particular point, whether the amniotic fluid is clear. If it's clear, I've said you indicate with a C, which is Z, normal. But if it is meconium stained, you indicate with, a, with an M. If it is odd meconium stained, you indicate with OM. Then if it is blood stained, you indicate with a B. Then from there, the next thing that you need to do is check for mouthing. So remember mouthing, this you observe how the, uh, the fetal skull, the bones of the fetal skull are overlapping each other or where they are, where they, whether they are opposing each other. And if they are overlapping each other, meaning one bone is resting on the other, one fetal skull bone is resting on the other, and you determine whether they are reducible or not, or not reducible. So in this particular case, when you check for mouthing, you find that the sutures are meeting but not overlapping each other, meaning the bones are just like that, but they are not resting on each other. You are going to indicate with a single plus like that. So one plus shows that uh, the sutures are opposing each other, but they are not overlapping each other. But if the sutures are overlapping each other and they are reducible, so if the sutures are overlapping each other and they are reducible, meaning one bone is resting on the other, and when you use the pressure of your hand, they are able to be reduced back to normal like that. It means that you indicate with the two plus like that. So in the box of molding, you are going to indicate with the two plus. Because as you are doing VE, you go in, you feel that the bones are overlapping each other. And when you reduce them with your two fingers, they are reducible. That is what the two plus means. Then if you find that the sutures are overlapping, the bones, the fetal skull bone are overlapping each other, but they are not reducible. You try to reduce them with your fingers, they can't be reduced 
to opposing each other. It means that you're going to indicate with the three pluses like this. So you put three plus, three plus, it means that uh, the bonds are overlapping each other and they are not reducible. So on melding, that is what you indicate based on what you find. If the sutures are overlapping each other, I mean, if the sutures are opposing each other, you indicate with a single plus. If the sutures are overlapping each other and reducible, you indicate with a two plus. If the fetal skull bone are overlapping each other and they can't be reduced, you indicate with a three plus. So that is about the molding. Then we can move on to the next parameter. Okay, so let me just wrap this so that we have a clean working area. Okay, so we can move on to the next parameter. So when it comes to the pathograph as well, it has an area where you need to plot uh, the feet of skull as well as the contraction. So we come to the con we come to the contractions. When it comes to the pathograph, you also need to observe the fetal heart rate. So when it comes to the fetal heart rate as well, you need to have a fetoscope and you check the fetal heart rate frequently. So you, if you find, as you check for the fetal heart rate, if you record, you find to say, oh, the fetal heart rate is um, 120 over, uh, I mean, 150 over uh, or 130 over 120, then you record it as see, such. So since we are following this line at six centimeters, you will follow it all the way up. So let's say the fetal heart rate is at 120, then you can you are going to plot in that particular manner. And then you move if it is at if it's going at 140, then you are going to put an arrow like that to show that the fetal heart rate when you checked at six centimeters it was around 120, 140 over uh, 120. Or you if you check uh, the the heart rate rather which is uh, it just basically the pulse for the baby, it means that you're just going to put a dot at where the fetal heart rate is. So if it is, the fetal heart rate is 130, you follow as usual this line or at six centimeters and just put a dot to show that the fetal heart rate it is at 130 beats per minute. Then if you check again after two, after two hours, you find that the fetal heart rate probably <clears throat> You find that the fetal heart rate probably is at 120. You record it in like that until you continue recording until the baby is born, and you then be joining these lines like that to see how the fetal heart rate has been moving from the time of admission until when labor is uh, is ready to 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 be completed. So in terms of the fetal heart rate, you need to plot it in that particular manner as well. So you need to listen for the fetal heart rate and then plot it on the pathograph. Okay, so apart from the fetal heart rate, then we can move on down and talk about the next parameter. So then the cervix, dilatation, as well as the descent, you fill in the hours there. The next parameter that you need to look at are the you need to observe them uh, every 30 minutes and you need to feel for how many contractions are you able to get uh, in 30 minutes. I mean, in 10 minutes, every 30 minutes, you just take a 10 minute period to observe or feel for the contractions and you count how many you're able to feel in that particular space of time. Okay, so now let's take, for example, <clears throat> Okay, now, so let's take, for example, um, uh, you check the, the contractions in the first 30 minutes, well, the woman minutes, so in the first 30 minutes period for contractions, about four contractions, and these contr are not lasting more than, more than 20 seconds, you put, you are going to plot by using dots like that. So you plot all the way by using dots, if you're able to feel, so in this particular case, you plot to say you felt 
four contractions in 10 minutes in the first 30 minutes of admission and then those contractions each one was not lasting more than 20 seconds you use dots but then if you feel for the contraction and you find that each contraction or contractions are lasting between 20 seconds to 40 seconds you are going to use basically lines so you are going to feel um you are going to feel the, the, if you are able to feel four contractions uh, in a space of 10 minutes, you are going to fill these boxes with lines to show that this woman has more direct contractions. So you'll fill them with lines. Then apart from that, uh, if at all, the woman is able to feel uh, contractions which are lasting more than 40 seconds, in this particular case, you are going to shed the, these boxes in that particular manner. So you fill the boxes. So if the contractions were four, you fill the boxes by shedding them. And when you shed, it means that the contractions, the four contractions that you had felt, uh, this woman was able to experience each contraction lasting more than 40 seconds. If you use line, it means that the contractions were between 20 to 40 seconds. If you use dots, it means that the contractions were between uh, zero to at least less than 20 seconds per each contraction. So that is how you shed the contractions and you place the hand on the abdomen and you can literally feel uh, and count how many contractions are able to count in a space of 10 minutes when the contractions start. So once you fill in this particular portion based on what you're able to get, you now move on to oxytocin. So remember oxytocin uh, promotes uh, contractions and you mainly give it in IV fluids while in labor. So if at all in labor you have given the oxytocin here, you need to record the oxytocin as well as the drops in one minute. So if oxytocin given is the 10 international units, you write 10 here and you put a stroke per liter. So you, it means that you have been, uh, pushed in 10 international units of, oxy, uh, of oxytocin uh, per liter in one liter of uh, fluids. Then apart from that, the drops per minute, of course, you would have calculated the drops in a minute, whether it is 23 drops in a minute, 38 drops in a minute, or 42 drops in a minute. So if it's 42 drops in a minute, you, you put here 42 to show that the drops in a minute that are, are going through the giving set, they're about 42 in one minute. So this, you record it, if at all you have given oxytocin, if you have not given oxytocin, meaning you leave it blank, unless if you give oxytocin so that you augment labor or you quicken labor. Then apart from that, the other parameter that we can talk about is the parameter down here, which is saying drugs, as well as IV fluids. So if you have given, if you have started the patient on any IV fluids, you are going, uh, we start with the drugs. If you have started the patient on any drug, let's say when the patient came in, you, or at this particular point, you have started the patient on metronidazole. It means here you record to say you have given the patient metronidazole. If you have given normal saline, uh, you, if you have given normal saline, you record to say given normal saline 500 uh, meals like that. So you, this particular portion, you just record whatever drugs that have been given to the patient or fluids that have been given. If there is no drug that have been given well and good, you leave it blank. If you have given an antibiotic or anything, you record it on this particular portion. So this particular part, again, you need to record the mother's spouse, the mother's blood pressure, uh, you need to record it here as well as the mother's temperature, which you need to record at this particular portion. So if you check the mother's uh, blood pressure, let's say this, uh, you have opened the uh, photograph at six centimeters. So you follow the same box uh, down on the boxes downwards, as well as boxes up uh, that particular part we started from. So you follow the same line, the same boxes. So now let's say this woman, you check her blood pressure, using a sphygmomanometer, you'll find that her blood pressure is 130 over 100. It means that you're going to follow this line. If this is where six centimeter is, you put an arrow like that. And where you go where 100 is, you put an arrow like that. And then you shade this particular line. It shows that the woman's blood pressure is 130 over 
100. Then when it comes to the pulse, let's say you check the pulse of this woman and the pulse, uh, let's say the pulse is around 80 beats per minute. It means that you follow this line and put a dot on the same line like that. And the dot indicates pulse. It means that this woman's pulse is 80 beats per minute. Then when it comes to temperature, you get, um, uh, you, you use, you check, one, once you check the patient's temperature, you find that her temperature is let's say 36.5 degrees Celsius. You just record it here to say the temperature is 36.5 uh, degrees uh, Celsius like that. So you record it in that particular box but you'll find that certain pathographs, you also record the temperature here, meaning you use different pens because also temperature you use dots and then you'll be joining the dots like that to give you a particular curve as you continue checking the temperature. So apart from that, you'll find that when it comes to, um, uh, to recording, uh, the pulse, you need to record the pulse every 30 minutes. Then apart from that, you also need to record the blood pressure, the pulse every 30 minutes once this woman is admitted in labor. So the uh, orbs, you need to do them every 30 minutes and you continue recording and checking how this woman's labor is progressing as well as her condition as well. Then the last thing that you need to check is urine. When it comes to urine, you need to record the, uh, the woman's urine output every two hourly or four hourly. So you need to check the urine output every two hourly or four hourly. And once you get the urine, you need to do some type of mini urinalysis where you check for protein. If there's presence of protein, you indicate with a plus that proteins are there. If there's presence of acetone, you indicate if there's, and also indicate the volume. So let's say when the urine comes out from this woman, the urine output is uh, 250 mils. It means that here you record, you say 250 mils like that. Then if there's presence of acetone, you record. If there's presence of proteins, you record. Remember presence of proteins, it may indicate that this particular woman has preeclampsia. Uh, hypertension in pregnancy, then acetone as well may indicate that this woman is lacking the energy because now the body is breaking down the fats for glucose. So you need to give them some energy giving foods because when the cervix reaches 10 centimeters wide, they will have it difficult to push. Apart from that, it may just indicate maybe this is a diabetic woman may go into ketoacidosis because of the acetone presence. So in terms of urine, these are the things that you need to check. You need to do them four hour, two hourly or four hourly. So when it comes to the pathograph, these are the parameters that you need to record. Just remember that this is the tool we use to monitor uh, the progress of labor uh, in a woman who is pregnant and admitted to the labor ward. So remember that you always start with this particular part. Come check the, the amniotic fluid, mounting, fetal heart rate, then is oxytocin given, indicate that it has been given and also record the drops in a minute. Record if there are any drugs given and then check the mother's pulse to check the urine at least two to four hourly. So this is how you record the pathograph and how you record it will depend on the parameters that this particular client have during your OSCE examination. So end here.